Now, why do I bring this up in particular? Because it helps reinforce uh, the understanding, I hope, that your low speed damping can affect seemingly very fast motions. What this is also especially relevant to is the fact that humans can move quickly, but we cannot accelerate very quickly. Now, the rider on the bike can respond very actively to frequencies below a certain level. So below about two and a half hertz, uh, that means back and forth two and a half times per second, uh, the rider can actually really be part of the suspension, be an active part of the suspension. Once we get above that frequency, though, all of a sudden the rider can't keep up. And so what happens is that the rider freezes right up, and that essentially forces the suspension to start to comply. The very interesting thing about this, though, is that this is more related to frequency than it is to speed. Now we start having a bit of a disconnect where the high frequency bumps that are happening at low shaft speeds, low velocities that your low speed adjuster is affecting, the rider can't respond fast enough for these low speed inputs, but we can actually respond fast enough for higher velocity inputs at a lower frequency. This is where I have a bit of a beef with the concept that hysteresis, reduced lag of the damper, is necessarily a good thing. Now in car racing, uh, absolutely. In fact, there are devices that called inerters that go so far as to almost actively preempt uh, the damping force. <laughs> However, with mountain bikes, the demands are completely different. So what we're really looking for is the best response we can get to the smaller stuff um, without having something that moves excessively around in its travel and is unstable in the, in the very macro sense, you know, in the, the large motions. As a result, um, designs that go to some extremes to reduce hysteresis um, and, and then advertise that as though it's a selling point. It makes no sense. It's actually counterproductive. So those dampers with the lower hysteresis basically generate damping force with less lag from the input. Now, this less lag always sounds like a good thing, right? But the whole idea of suspension is that there is literally a lag between what the ground does and where the bike and the rider move. Uh, you know, the sprung mass of the bike. So... The idea that always reducing lag in the damping response is a good thing and increases traction is false. But anyway, the relevance to you as a rider is understanding uh, why it is that excessive low speed damping is so damaging when there, there is a lot of talk in the suspension industry in particular um, of you know having something that is firm at low speeds and then blows off at high speeds um, or you know opens up at high speeds that's great but by the time you've got to the high speed you've already gone through this low speed region and not every single input that's happening and is perceived to be quick is actually reaching a particularly high speed and so the low speed damping if it's excessive um, you know if we're getting damping at really low speeds can actually be quite damaging to bump compliance even though the conventional wisdom is that it isn't so as a result very digressive valve systems can be very counterproductive because we have these systems that are trying to be firm and give us you know a platform or whatever um, and then you know open up as soon as something moves fast enough or generates enough pressure the the problem is that by the time it gets to the point where that velocity is sufficient to generate the pressure in order to open the valve the damage is already done the wheel hasn't moved out of the way fast enough or far enough. Uh, and as a result, we get a higher shaft speed. We get more lateral acceleration of the bike. Uh, any, any bump has like a, a vertical and a horizontal component to it. And your body doesn't really distinguish between the two. Why is the speed of that initial response uh, and the wheel's ability to comply with the ground so important? Like, you know, these very small bumps, why does that affect harshness so much? If we look at it relative to the direction that the axle can move, so we're looking at a fork here, but the same is true uh, comparing to the axle path of a rear shock. This front axle moves in line with this green axis here. Any force component that is parallel to that direction uh, will create some motion of the suspension. However, anything perpendicular to that creates no motion of the suspension, and in that direction, uh, other than whatever the tires can do, 
uh, and you know the the flex and the frame and the wheel and the fork. In that direction, there is no suspension. So any force that occurs parallel with that red dotted line here um, creates an acceleration through the frame, a sense like a jolt, a sense of harshness. That force is being transmitted to you. So, you know, whatever is happening there is being pushed into the frame uh, and there, you know, the handlebars and the pedals into you. Any component of that force that's coming through here and that force vector is denoted by this blue line here uh, is creating not only a compression of the suspension, but a lateral acceleration, or in this case, sorry, a longitudinal acceleration of the bike uh, that can also be perceived as harshness. Now, we tend to think of things uh, vertically with suspension, you know, that everything's up and down because the ground, you know, we're moving that way and harshness is moving that way. It isn't really true. Your body doesn't necessarily distinguish between, you know, your handlebars getting pushed backwards um, as harshness and getting pushed upwards. So, it is kind of useful to understand that there are knock-on effects from increasing things like that low-speed compression damping past a certain point um, or having something where we are in any way reducing the wheel's ability to get out of the way quickly. Now, does this mean that we should just, you know, totally get rid of compression damping? Absolutely not. No. Compression damping can be very, very useful. Compression damping can actually reduce the peak force uh, that you see from bumps. That sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. The reason for that is that whatever input is given to the suspension will be unobstructed by anything other than the spring. If there is no damping, it will not be resisted by anything. And so the peak force that we see from the suspension looking, you know, coaxial to the fork or the or the, mo the motion of the, the rear wheel. The highest force that the suspension will generate comes from the peak force of the spring. So the further the thing is compressed, the higher the peak force. Now, if we slow things down a little bit so it doesn't quite compress as far, then we can reduce that peak force without necessarily introducing a higher force from the compression damping. Uh, how to work out how much of that compression damping is useful and at what point it becomes damaging is pretty difficult. Um, and it takes a lot of analysis to do that. However, this is part of the way that compression damping can actually reduce harshness. And so there is there is definitely a sentiment out there that, it, you know, if something's too harsh, back off your compression damping. That might help. It might not. If you're running into a wall of progression at the end of the travel, uh, then reducing the amount of travel that you're using might actually reduce the peak force that you're getting and the, you know, the sensation of harshness that's coming through to you as a result. This is starting to sound like contradictory messages, I realize there's, you know, compression damping can can massively impact harshness in negative ways, and it can also, you know, impact harshness in positive ways. And, and this, is, this is completely aside from looking at the stability, you know, and the stabilizing effect of, uh, of compression damping. This is purely looking at force transmission. To recap, what the whole point of this uh, was is essentially that Increasing the rate at which your damper actually generates a damping force by decreasing the lag, that means you know, decreasing your hysteresis, uh, or by simply bumping up your low speed compression damping excessively to the point where you know, the, whole, the thing is essentially locked out until a certain force, which is what the old uh, SPV and you know, platform style valves did. What that does is generates a force at zero speed, and then you know, we have to create a certain amount of force to even to, to even allow the thing to move at all, and at that point, you know, force is already being transmitted through to the rider. Uh, this is the same reason that, you know, inertial valves have struggled, is that by the time the valve has responded, some of that force is already being transmitted. Now, if that can be minimized, that's, that's all well and good. And, you know, if you can get it down to an acceptable threshold, that's fine. But the speed of that initial response has a huge influence uh, on the harshness because it affects the... Oh, the velocity that the wheel ends up moving at. So the more delayed the response is, the closer this axle gets to here before it starts moving up. And that basically means that instead of arcing smoothly up and over, like so, it ends up basically getting to here and then being like, oh crap, I still have to get up to here to get over this bump. And so it goes, uh-oh, up to there. Uh, in that time, the tire is compressed x distance, and that means that more force is being transmitted through to the, both through to the suspension, uh, and perpendicular 
to the motion of the suspension. It can really impact the peak velocities of the suspension and therefore, you know, the peak damping forces that we see. Um, and it also adds to that harshness and the hanging up feeling. The point here is to understand how low speed damping, what, what is the mechanism by which low speed damping can negatively impact bump compliance. It isn't say low speed damping is a bad thing. It isn't. Above a certain point it is. That's enough rambling for this week. Thanks for watching and we will see you very shortly.